All right, I'm Dave Ratt, and people have been sending me some links to comments on Reddit about me. And I thought it would be fun and interesting to dive in and take a look at the comments and um, maybe and respond to them and um, you know see what I can see what they're saying and see what I can do to um, share info and be of assist. So I'm going to start with this one. It's a um, post by the Ace Three, and it says, "I don't understand Dave Rat." Now, this is just my opinion, and I don't do gigs anywhere near the size of Dave's. My biggest shows are 800 cap, and every once in a while, a festival of 3,000 cap. In an interview, he mentions that he does not send the same signal to left and right, such as having two mics on a kick drum, one being panned hard left and the other being panned hard right. Another, he mentioned, is having a mic on the top and bottom of the snare panned hard left and hard right. This simply does not make any sense to me in my mind. When I'm mixing a band, I like to have the band sound evenly mixed and sound the same for everyone. I understand that that is a small difference in sound, but it seems like an unnecessary complication. Can anyone help me understand why you would want this? Thank you. Okay, well this is great and uh, very much in the pocket for stuff that I've been looking at and trying to understand and study for many years. The goal is, or may be for some, but not all, there's so many different vast variations of what we decide to do with um, sound reinforcement. So having anything that blankets it and uh, puts a universal, this is right or wrong, is inherently incorrect. Now, Having it sound the same everywhere so that everyone has as similar of an experience as possible is desirable and um, for many applications. That said, it's not necessarily natural. If we're reproducing a band playing and you're in a rehearsal room, I mean, some of the most exciting live experiences I've had is watching, being in the, re in the room while Rage or Peppers or Soundgarden is rehearsing, and being able to walk around the room and being on one side and hearing more bass and being on the other side and hearing more guitar and getting in the middle and, and the, you know, everything's kind of coming from different places throughout the room. And that's the natural way that a band or music works. It's, it's um, all these sources that are bouncing off the walls in different directions and creating their own vectors of sound. And we're immersed in this field. Now, Pro Audio, what we do is we take all of those different things and we mix them all together and we spit them out of a single speaker or a group of speakers or an array of speakers with lows, mids, highs or whatever. But we try or the manufacturers try to create a unified homogenous source that takes all these and creates them from a locale. Uh, that's not natural to the world we live in. Things naturally come from different spaces. The bass came from over here, the guitar came from over here, and the vocals came from here, and the drums came from there. And now we've put them all and have them all come out of here, and we've all come out of here. Having it sound the same no matter where you are in the venue is not necessarily natural or realistic, but it's not a bad thing, and it can be uh, applicable to many situations. In addition to that, if you do send the exact same thing to the left and right, you think you may be creating the same sound everywhere. But what happens is, is if you're center and you're equidistant from both sources, you can hear both things the same. But as soon as you move off to the side, you begin to hear comb filtering. You begin to hear the interaction of the different distances you are from one speaker or the other and they interact and cause issues at varying frequencies. So when you slightly move, it causes a phase shift at high frequencies, one side versus the other. As you move more, that frequency drops farther and farther down. Now, if you take one instrument, let's say your guitar, and you run it exactly the same into both sides, and you take five steps off to the side, and maybe there's a 800 cycle, phase shift or a hole at 800 on the guitar 
from both sides. Now you take your base and run it into both sides and you move those same dis that same distance off center. That same frequency is going to have that same issue. That frequency is dependent on the PA location. So if you take your entire mix and you send the exact same thing into both, you're guaranteeing that this spot 20 paces off to the side is going to have an issue at 250 for every single instrument. It's not until you start to differentiate what you send to left and right that you can start to move these cancellation modes, this comb filtering out and around and have it occur at different places throughout the venue at different frequencies. So we can't get rid of it if we have mono signals. We can't get rid of it if you have a single guitar or whatever, unless you have decorrelated sources. Decorrelated sources is when you have two completely unrelated, like you have the bass over here and the guitar over here. They won't interact, or they'll interact in a very minor way. But that's not feasible for us. We can't run all the bass to the left and all the guitar to the right, because then that would deny people in larger venues to hear everything. But what we can do is start to decorrelate these things. Now, decorrelation of sound is something that, like, the L Acoustics Elisa system's based on. When I first started doing double hung PAs and started running vocals and drums into, vocals and bass into one PA and guitar and drums into another and hung those PA side by side, I was decorrelating, I was getting, I was running two PA side by side that wouldn't interact with each other because there's no common signals. Decorrelation, when I did that, uh, when I was visiting L Acoustics, Christian Heil brought me in and showed me the very beginnings of Elisa, this decorrelated. He says, you get it. You understand that it's okay to have PA side by side as long as they're not reproducing the same signal. And the same applies to left and right. If they're not reproducing the same signal, you eliminate your comb filtering. Not necessarily feasible, but something to think about. Now, there are ways that we can reduce those comb filtering issues. And one way we could do it is we mic the beater with one mic in the kick drum, we mic the resonant head with another, and we pan those slightly out left and right. So we're not sending exactly the same thing to both channels. And now we got a bit of a stereo. So maybe we've got like more of a little tighter kick sound over here, a little looser over here, but they're not identical. And they don't have the same time frame. Maybe it's poof, poof. You know, and this one's got a little longer. So when this one's fired up, when it lingers here, those comb filterings don't exist. It's only when the exact same frequency reproduced at the exact same level at the exact same time that all of the issues set up in the exact same places. There's other ways we can break these things up. We can take the kick drum and run it, just a single kick mic, and run it a little louder to one side and a little quieter to the other. And we could take the bass and run it a little louder to one side and a little quieter, quieter to the other. Not so much that it sounds bad in either place, but so that we don't get those exact same nulls and the same depth of nulls. When we're talking about nulls, if you take two signals and you have them out of polarity, if they're exactly the same volume, you can almost get silence. But as soon as they're slightly off of the same volume, it comes back pretty quick. Well, the same thing applies when you have two signals, one in left and one in right, and you're off center, and you're at a place where you're getting a comb filtering null, and maybe that null is 10 or 20, 10, 15 dB deep. Well, if you were to turn that instrument down 3 dB in one side, that null would be much less drastic. So just differentiating, creating small errors between the identical signals sent to left and right. You can not only do it with volume differentials between left and right, but you can do it with time differentials. You can put a, a delay on the guitar going to one side versus the other and put the opposite delay on the bass going to one side versus the other and have them null or cancel at different places. This is called Haas panning. And Haas panning is using delay in order to shift a signal from one side to the other instead of using level panning. So we can use time, we can use 
uh, level and we can use signal differentials. And to create signal differentials, we could do things like take two different microphones and mic different parts of the speaker or different parts of the cabinet and set them so they sound similar, but they're marking a diff miking a different point in space or a different area. And then EQ them, which introduces phase errors, phase shifts, EQ them to sound similar. So now we've got different parts of the cone miked with different types of mics with different EQs. Now, when you take those two signals and you sum them together, they won't sum perfectly, but they also won't cancel perfectly. And you can test this yourself and prove it to yourself by taking two mics, miking the exact same point as close as you can, or taking a single mic and running it into two channels and hitting a polarity verse and summing it back with itself, and you'll hear that it gets very quiet. Now put two mics on there and hit a polarity verse on one, two identical mics, and see how quiet you can get it. Not quite as quiet. Now take two different mics and mic different parts of the box. And now put a polarity verse on one and you even have less ability to get them to null. And the better you can create a scenario where they don't null, the more decorrelation you have and the better it will be at breaking up those comb filtering issues. So this is a concept, how you implement it and how you use these tools is up to you and your application. I am just highlighting these things that exist and not just highlighting them because there's a lot of importance when you're looking at threads of people speaking and offering advice. The first thing you want to ask yourself is, is this person credible? who's writing this post or why are they angry? Usually the people that know the least have the most to say and are the most upset about it. Have they offered proof? Is there any testing going on? Is there any data that supports their position or have they obscurely referred to ethereal things of I was at a show and I heard them, if whatever. Now, a lot of stuff, I've read a lot of comments and they refer to, well, what does Dave say about this? Or what does he say about that? Oh, if only there was a way to figure that out, like going to the site and looking at the video you're talking about. I share my information. I'm not anonymous. A lot of people present a lot of information from an anonymous position. Ask someone who they are what they've done to offer that opinion and what is their credibility. I'm easy to understand. I'm easy to find. I'm easy to research. I've put a lot out there. I spend a tremendous amount of time sharing the info that I've learned so that people can have the information that I wish I had when I started doing sound. And I'm curious and I'm learning and I love testing. And when I do my tests, I do them with simple, inexpensive gear so they can be recreated at home by anyone. I try and minimize anything expensive. In fact, I have a test right now, which is kind of cool, just to show this decorrelation. All right, I hope you enjoyed the first episode of Rat Responds to Reddit and answering this question of I don't understand Dave Rat was fun and I covered a bunch of topics I hope you found interesting and in future episodes I will dive into some more nefarious comments people taking swipes and offering all kinds of strong opinions and give you some insight as to the way I see the things involved with sound as well as maybe have some fun.